Good afternoon. I am Celeste Watkins Hayes, the Joan and Sanford Wild Dean of the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy here at the University of Michigan. And I also serve as the founding director of the Center for Racial Justice here at the Ford School. I'm delighted to welcome all of you this afternoon to our policy talks at the Ford School event. Today's event is part of the Harry A. and Margaret D. Towsley Foundation Lecture Series hosted by our Towsley Policymaker in Residence, Judge Laurel Beatty Blunt. <laughs> Judge Beatty Blunt sits on the 10th District Court of Appeals in Columbus, Ohio, to which she was elected in 2018. She's previously served on the Franklin County Court of Common Pleas for nine years. Her legal career started in private practice and then moved to the public sphere when she became Director of Legislative Affairs and Counsel to the Voting Rights Institute for the Ohio Secretary of State. In that role, Judge Betty Blunt served as liaison to the Ohio General Assembly and 88 county boards of elections. Of course, election integrity remains a potent issue today. She will be speaking with Michigan Supreme Court Justice Kyra Harris Bolden. Welcome, welcome. <laughs> Governor Gretchen Whitmer appointed Justice Bolden to the bench just, oh, just one year ago, making her the first black woman to serve on the state's highest court. She had been a state legislator in the Michigan House for four years, and prior to that, she worked in private practice and also as state attorney in the Third Circuit Court of Wayne County and is a court-appointed criminal defense attorney for the 46th District Court of Southfield. These two judi judicial leaders have their own stories about their journeys to the bench, and their stories go back generations. As Judge Beatty Blunt described to me, in different ways, their grandfathers endured racism, exclusion, and barriers of all kinds. And now, here they are. While we, of course, continue to confront racism and bigotry, we can see progress through their stories. We look forward to an interesting and enlightening discussion. There will be time for questions at the end. We have two colleagues here who will be passing around microphones, so look out for them during the Q&A. Katrina's here, wonderful. With that, please join me in welcoming the judges, Judge Beatty Blunt <laughs> and Justice yes. Bolden. <laughs> Dean Watkins Hayes, the judges, it makes it sound like we just need to take I this know, on the road. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we can start a podcast. Exactly. <laughs> Justice Bolden, first of all, thank you, thank you a million times over um, for being here. It was somewhat of a professional courtesy from, from one judge to another. So thank you very much for lending us yes. your time. My pleasure. My pleasure. So I, I wanted to start with history. Yes. Um, for, for me, I was a question asker as a child. Mm. And so I heard a lot of my grandparents' stories. And so I am very aware that the, the really the success of, of my family mm -hmm. came from my grandfather owning one of two black restaurants that black people were permitted to dine at in Columbus, Ohio. Mm. Um, you know, through them telling me about history, you know, I learned that their restaurant was in the Green Book, in the Green Book being kind of the guide for black travelers of that time of restaurants and hotels it was safe to go to. I mean, the Green Book was their mm -hmm. marketing plan. Mm -hmm. um, talk a little bit about your family's history with racism. Yeah, so I, I've been very public um, about my family's history um, because I think it's important to know a person's motivation for engaging, especially on this level. And for me, um, I was a question asker, but this, uh, the story of my great grandfather was actually never discussed. Mm, yes, yes. In, in mm -hmm. our family, um, my great grandmother, who I had the great fortune of having until senior year of college. Oh, wow. Yeah, I, it, wonderful, wonderful woman. Um, so it was when she was getting older in between her stories and her boys, which which were the Tigers baseball game, uh -huh. and, and looking out of her window and, you know, making sure everything was on the up and up, 
um, she would just start telling me stories. She wanted to tell me recipes and mm -hmm. uh, all, all these different things. And she told me the story of my great grandfather, Jesse Lee Bond. And he was a cotton farmer in Tennessee. And he was lynched um, in 1939 after asking a store owner for a receipt. And um, I, a, a question that I usually get is, why would someone be lynched for asking for a receipt? Mm -hmm. And my response is always, it wasn't the receipt, it was the audacity. Right, right. For um, a 19, 20 year old to essentially uh, want verification that the store owner was being truthful about what was owed and um, how much things cost, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so a, a lynch mob ensued and um, he, Jesse Lee Bond was beaten and castrated and thrown into the local river and the coroner deemed it an accidental drowning. And there is a documentary about uh, my, this lynching um, called Accidental Drowning. If there's anyone that's interested, my family did a wonderful job telling the story of my great grandfather. Um, but as a result, his murders were acquitted of the crime because of the coroner's designation that it was an accidental drowning. Mm -hmm. And in hearing that, um, I al always had a strong sense of justice, which I'm sure you did, <laughs> right. did too. <laughs> yeah. Um, I would always, my favorite phrase growing up was, that's not fair. <laughs> um, you probably said it just like that. I did. I did. My mom says, time for bed. That's not fair. Because my sister stayed up until, you know, whatever time when she was my age. I, literally, I, I would bring the, bring the receipts, right? So, um, so hearing that, and then there are some other things that happened, but it just kind of fueled my sense for justice. Mm -hmm. And realizing that it happened in my own family, it made it really real for me mm -hmm. that it wasn't just something that happened in history, which I knew, but that it was only a couple generations removed from me that government sanction and justice was the norm. Right, right. And isn't it, it's, it is impactful that this is your family story and someone who you love, who is a part of your family, was the one that told it to mm -hmm. you. It, it wasn't something that you read in a book or you mm -hmm. saw in a movie. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, I would imagine for you, like me, when your family story is questioned or not received well, it, it can be very hurtful. Yeah, I, I, did, I did have several people reach out to me and tell me that I was disgusting, disgusting for essentially using my family story to try to garner support. And I will say behind the scenes, I had to have a really deep conversation with my family members, my mother, my grandmother who's still living, um, to make sure that it was okay mm -hmm to tell this story because it had been kept from me until I was an adult in college. And so the hurt and the pain and anger that's associated with it is very real. And I would have never discussed it without having that conversation with my family because it, it's, it was difficult for them. Right. You mm -hmm. know, it wasn't, it wasn't even just, just about me, but I also f had to explain that it is important to tell these stories um, it is important for people to know that we are not so far removed and that history can repeat itself if we're not vigilant. And so, um, you know, the comments, it, it, they bothered me at first, but then at some point you just get a sense of resolve, which you, you, have, you just mm -hmm. have to build up and just say, look, this is me, this is my story, this is my family, and this is who I am. And I, I can't shy away from that. And if that, if you make a decision um, to not, you know, support me or what, then that, then that just has to be your decision. But I can't 
change what happened in my family. Mm -hmm. And I'm also going to continue to discuss it because I think it's important. It's an important part of my story and important to who I am and important to our society as well. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but, but there were many conversations about um, actually me being vocal about that, our, my great grandfather's story. And it, it can even lead to some, um, you know, knowledge of your history mm -hmm. could even lead to some interesting moments in law school. Mm -hmm. um, when you're taught, you know, like constitutional law, mm -hmm. criminal law, criminal procedure. Mm -hmm. um, and, and did you, like me, find yourself sometimes thinking, oh, but not necessarily for everyone oh, yeah. or man, how, how many things in the Bill of Rights were violated with Emmett Till case alone? Right. I mean, it just just so many things. And when 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 you when you say we the people, mm -hmm. who are we talking about? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, when you when you say that women were able to vote, which women? Right. Were able to vote at a particular time, and I I think. You know, there needs to, to be real truth telling because how can you how can you explain where we are today without understanding our history? Right. And why this is so momentous for a lot of people. Um, for example, obviously I'm, uh, I shouldn't say obviously, I'm the first black woman to sit on the Michigan Supreme Court for those that, that didn't know. And yes, no. <laughs> And, and, and I don't say that for applause, and actually it, it kind of makes me cringe because it's 2023, and mm -hmm. to me it's just unacceptable. Right, you're taking my next question, actually. I'm go sorry. Ahead. No, go <laughs> ahead. Go no, ahead. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> okay. okay, I'm sorry. Unhook the other one. Or sit it on the side. Okay. <laughs> Uh, no, please go Neither. ahead. Oh, no. <laughs> Knowing all of that, I'm I'm the first black woman mm -hmm. on my court, too. And I just when I re when someone told me that, I just never really thought I'm like, wow, it's it's this century and and they're still first. Like, I just didn't. Exactly. And that that's exactly how I felt or feel still to this day, because it's almost you have to celebrate it because of our history. But if you don't acknowledge it, it's almost as if saying that there was not a qualified black woman before me, right? And, right. and that's mm -hmm. not the case. Um, I have supported and, and worked towards this goal um, for years mm -hmm. um, because I think representation is so important. And so I, it's, it's really hard for me to say that I'm the first black woman um, because I know a lot of the, the black women that have, that fought so hard for this position. Mm -hmm. Um, and again, it's 2023. This is just unacceptable. Mm -hmm. This is unacceptable. So, but we just have to make sure that, you know, we might be the first, but that doesn't mean that there's not going to be second, thirds and fourths. Absolutely. Um, so tell me a little bit about your journey to the bench. Okay. Um, I, I know it goes through the state house. It does, and I'll, I'll skip ahead to that. Um, but, well, maybe I won't because it, I think other things were really important, um, especially to you all, because I know a lot of people see me and they're just thinking, or sometimes, maybe you're not. Maybe I shouldn't assume. She has it all together. You know, she's been planning this since she was two years old mm -hmm. and. Um, the fact of the matter is um, I never intended on going to law school or pursuing a career in law until uh, really my senior year. And uh, obviously the story of my great grandmother happened. And quite frankly, I didn't want to be a psychologist, but I got my psychology degree because we're not starting over. Am I right? Okay. Right. <laughs> so I actually had to take a year off because I did not plan to go to law school right after college. So I, I took a year off, studied for the LSAT, uh, went to law school, and, um, and graduated at a time where the economy was 
absolutely terrible. Oh. They were talking about making the bar exam even harder to uh, reduce the amount of attorneys because there weren't any jobs. And so um, I, because of the relationships that I built and being part of bar organizations and things like that, I actually had a couple of judges that pulled me aside and they said, you know, it's obviously you take a course for to do to do criminal law to get certified to, to get court appointed cases, but they said you can take court appointed cases in, in my court and that's how I initially got my, my start. Mm -hmm. One of the judges that I practiced in front of, Judge Sheila Johnson, who also ran for Michigan Supreme Court, uh, we became very, very close. When there was a job available for uh, Judge John A. Murphy, who I clerked for, that job wasn't posted. Uh, he sent it to um, one of the bar associations. She said, you need to apply for this job. I'm sending you a recommendation. Send your application today. Mm -hmm. So he ended up, obviously I interviewed and sent writing samples, but he ended up selecting me. Now again, this was a position that, that was not posted. Mm -hmm. And so if anybody can garner anything from this conversation, there are going to be, there are going to be very, a lot of jobs that are not posted. You have to build your network enough that when something comes available, you get the call. Yeah. And, and, and that is just how a lot of it works. It is, it is who you know. Obviously, you have to be prepared. You have to do well. You have to be qualified. But you also have to be in the room. Um, and because I had been in the room, um, you know, I was referred. When I went to um, my civil litigation practice, that job wasn't posted. My partner was actually one of my mentors through a bar association that I was a part of. Mm. And she had, we, we had had lunch once a year and just kept the relationship, never expected to work for her but I was clerking as a judicial law clerk and she texted me and said, hey, my law firm's looking for an associate, would you be interested? I don't know how many other people she texted, but I have a feeling that I might have been one of three. Mm -hmm. So I very unprofessionally said, yes, <laughs> I did. I texted her back because we were friends at the time. I said, I am so sorry. Uh, I will send my resume and close of business and my <laughs> writing samples. And again, that's just how a lot of this works. And even running for state representative, I had to be asked. You know, I was at my law firm job. I'm doing civil litigation. Um, I was thinking about maybe running for city council. Mm -hmm. Definitely running for the state house was not on my radar at all. But sometimes people will see something in you that you don't see in yourself. Mm -hmm. And that's why you have to continuously work hard. Um, and, and it may not be as you know, vo boisterous as, as others, but people are watching you. They're watching everything you do. And I, I'm always a person that just kind of quietly does the work and, you know, minds my business so I was asked to run for uh, the house seat multiple times because I said no I've never run a campaign before I've never never done that um, they finally convinced me <laughs> and I took a leave from my law firm job and, and thankfully they were supportive um, of that and they said if you win um, then great if you lose you can come back and that comes from building great relationships that I had with them. So I knew I had a safety net, um, but I also didn't have any income. So, <laughs> <laughs> I, so I used all my savings and I ended up winning my primary uh, with 45% of the vote with five opponents. Wow. Um, because there was, uh, when I put my mind to something, I'm gonna work hard. I, I, and it, it may not be super loud, but I'm gonna do what's necessary. And so um, how we got here, I'm, 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 I'm just trying to make sure that people know that it wasn't, one, I wasn't plucked out of obscurity because, mm -hmm. they, because people think that a lot about particularly black women in positions of power. And so I just want to address that. Mm -hmm. um, I, I was not plucked out of obscurity and certainly not a token. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but I was quietly 
doing the work in the legislature. Um, I, I was able to get five bills passed into law, I sat on the Judiciary Committee for four years, built great relationships within my caucus and on across the aisle, um, because as you know, we, we served in the minority, so um, if you don't have great relationships, you don't get a bill passed, and that's right. or if you don't have a good idea, you're not gonna get it. Right. You wouldn't have gotten the five, we, 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 uh, yeah. No, uh -huh. no, no, no. Um, but some of the bills that I was able to get passed were just common sense, so amending the Medically Frail Act, which allowed for parole for um, those that were in prison that met the, the criteria. So people that were in, there are, are people in prison that are in comas that can't get parole because of how the law worked. Mm -hmm. um, it's, a, it's a great use of tax dollars. <laughs> Again, uh, I, I, I was just trying to save people money <laughs> and, and help, right? Um, the Address Confidentiality Act, which um, I just mm -hmm. read is going into um, effect now, which conceals the address of victims of sexual violence. Um, and I amended the Wrongful Imprisonment Compensation Act so that more people were able to get compensated for um, uh, if they were wrongly imprisoned. Okay. So I'm just minding my business, quietly doing the work. And in June of 2021, I was asked to run for the Michigan Supreme Court. And I said no, mm -hmm. <laughs> because I am 34. I have a great job that I love in the legislature. Um, I'm making a huge difference for my community and people across the state of Michigan. Um, so I didn't really f see a benefit for me to run, um, much less against two incumbents. Mm. <laughs> there were there were a lot of negatives here. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And if I didn't win, then I would be giving up my job in the legislature, right? Um, but what ended up happening was I got pregnant and as much as my thought process initially was, I don't want to run for office, a statewide office, mm -hmm. while being pregnant, while having a full-time job in the legislature, as my baby girl grew inside my narrative switched to how could i ever tell my child that she could be anything that she wanted to be and i had the opportunity to have an impact on the michigan supreme court or to just even run for that representation it just means so much to so many people um and i didn't take that opportunity mm. and that weighed with me um, so much so that I decided to run. So we're here because I didn't want to be a hypocrite. So I'm so, so sorry. <laughs> Whatever so sorry. works. Right. <laughs> when I put my mind to something. Um, so, and so that was my journey. So you get on the bench. Mm -hmm. You're a 34-year-old black mm -hmm. woman. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I'm just going to say it too. Um, and you're attractive. <laughs> because Because... I, I think being attractive can be tricky for women, particularly in a profession like the law and particularly in a judge like a job like judge. Yeah. Um, being pretty can hurt you because people autumn, you know, when they think of a judge, they think of an older, white, wise man. And that was not you. You might have been wise, but you know, people had to get through a lot of things mm -hmm. before they could ever tell whether you were wise or not. No, that that's very true. And I'm also very, you know, you, I'm, I'm just also very, some, as some may describe, and this may not be the right word, but um, I'm, I'm very extroverted. Um, some might say bubbly, you know, I'm very smiley. Mm -hmm. uh, people might, some, some might say, and um, I, I went somewhere and, and the, the person that I was there to see didn't know that I was the justice. And she, and she said, you don't look mean, judges look mean. <laughs> I would have never known that you were the justice. 
And and so yeah, I mean that's that is an extra layer of just I will say this. Being young, people will assume that you're unqualified. Exactly. Being a black woman, people are going to assume that you're unqualified. Um, being pregnant. Oh yes. Mm -hmm. Or having young kids, people are going to assume that you cannot do the job. Or what are you doing out here trying to do the job even? Or you supposed to be yeah. at home? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Go go sit at home and 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 bake, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and so I definitely had a lot of things that um, that I had to combat as far as a narrative. Um, but I just decided I'm going to be me and I'm just going to bring my full self to the table. And I think it's important that in some ways the judiciary is going to have to change because of me um, and, and not the other way around. Um, I, I think that um, I, I bring skills and experiences that none of the current justices uh, have. And I, and I think that that's how it's supposed to be. That's why there are seven of us right. mm -hmm. to, to bring diversity and, and thought process because Michiganders are not a monolith and neither should our courts. And so I am very happy that 1.3 million people saw fit to, um, to, to vote for me in that election, but I did still lose. So I just, mm -hmm. just wanna be clear, I, I acknowledge uh, that, that I, I lost that election and um and then yes was was appointed by the governor so that could not have been easy because you don't travel around an entire state pregnant pregnant <laughs> um and all that comes with that right um you don't travel around an entire state pregnant and work that hard for something and not be disappointed yes. so how did you get back up you know i i i at that point, well, let me start by saying, when I entered the race, I knew that there was a very, very high likelihood that I would make it, right? Okay. So I, I'm not, I don't think that I'm just that great that yeah. overcoming two incumbents is very, very difficult to do. And I knew that going in. Um, again, for me, it was important that representation was at the table so that we can continue to move the, the needle. Mm -hmm. But um, I did work very hard. And, um, you know, I went to the UP when I was seven months pregnant and then two months postpartum. And some of you may know that I, I accepted the nomination for Michigan Supreme Court six days after giving birth. So, uh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. There are videos, there are videos of that um, at Kyra H. Bolden. Follow me on social media. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I, I I I got up and in and did a speech and just you know just accepted the nomination. So um, worked extremely hard. So it was very disappointing uh, for me when I didn't win, even though I knew all the odds were stacked against me. Mm -hmm. um, but I was almost instantly uplifted and it was funny because I was still getting phone calls of I'm so sorry and I was and but I looked at the numbers and like I said when 1.3 million people take the time to I'm sorry I'm, I'm, I'm still like a year postpartum so I get emotional very quickly but um, you know with 1.3 million people in Michigan took the time to bubble in my name. Mm -hmm. And so I was instantly uplifted because it, that is such an honor in and of itself that even though I lost um, that election, um, it, it just, it, it really it really touched me that, that my message resonated with people um, for, for those types of numbers. Well, if you got 1.3 million votes pregnant, Imagine what happens next time. I know. <laughs> you know, when your feet aren't swollen. I know. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. So I want to talk to you a little bit about um, what you see in the future. Yeah. You know, our, um, you know, even within the law, you know, our nation is very polarized right now mm -hmm. on lots of different things. Um, you know, there are a lot of people that are feeling 
disillusioned, mm -hmm. particularly about um, the law's impact on racism. Yes. Tell me, um, having served on the bench now, having gone from the legislative branch to mm -hmm. the judicial branch, what's your take? You know, I am just so hopeful because even just looking at this audience, um, this audience could be anywhere doing anything right now and you're taking the time to listen to the both of us. And I just have so much hope for the future. Um, what I have seen from this generation has been amazing. The level of enthusiasm, the level of activism, and the level of demanding change. Um, mm -hmm. it, it just uplifts me. I am so inspired uh, by this next generation. Um, by my own generation too. I guess we're still technically young, but <laughs> um, but definitely by the by, by the next generation. Just the level of being involved, mm -hmm. um, knowing what's going on, and fighting for what uh, they believe in. Um, I I think our future is in good hands, and I'm I'm very very hopeful. How would you say? Um... You know, because these are students at the University of Michigan, one of, you know, very well-respected university. And I'm saying that even though I'm from Ohio. But anyway, um, you know, what would you tell them, Jessica Bolden, about preparing themselves for leadership? Yes. You know, I've talked in both of my classes teaching here, like, you have to be prepared for when you are the decision maker. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I would just say, Mentorship is so important for you to be a mentor and for you to have mentors. I have mentors that are younger than me. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, so I'm not talking about age. Someone that has a different experience than you that you can learn from and always be concerned about imparting your knowledge on somebody else. You can't be in the competition mindset because you never know where your career will take you, who you'll run into, um, and what will be a full circle moment. Um, for example, uh, Justice Bridget Mary McCormick, who was a professor here, who was um, my predecessor, um, her campaign was the first campaign I ever worked on. Okay. And she robed, she robed me. The first time I put on a robe, she literally took off her robe and put it on my back. <laughs> That's a very special moment. It was. And you can go to Kyra H. Bolden <laughs> on Instagram to see that video, too. No. Um, but it was a wonderful full circle moment. And I've had those throughout my career. And so networking, getting to know as many people as possible, um, mentorship. But you also have to learn to follow before you can lead. And I know that's going to be unpopular to say, but how do you know what you like, what you don't like, what your style might be if you haven't had those experiences? Um, so the judge that I worked for um, was a baby boomer, or he is a baby boomer. He's he's still alive. He's just retired. Um, he he is a is a baby boomer and so it was get to the office before mm -hmm. you don't leave until the judge leaves mm -hmm. you know it was very very stringent and i loved having that experience because now i understand how i run my chambers is just a little bit different right you know i always had to call the judge judge never you know by their first name so my staff called me kyra mm -hmm. um but but i'm glad i had those experiences with different bosses or different partners or whatever um so that i knew my style of how i wanted to lead and not to say that anything that anybody did was bad. I had really good experiences, but I was just able to hone my own leadership skills by being a, a, a good employee, being a good follower, being a good mentee. Mm -hmm. I am teaching this semester a class um, on state and local courts. Mm. And one of the things that I've talked a lot about in my class is that, you know, yes, it is easier to study 
federal law, particularly when it comes to like criminal justice. But there are so many areas that impact every pe everyday people's lives that are exclusively a matter that's in state courts. Yeah. Um, the, the courts you're most likely to come in contact with are traffic court, which is a local court, and unfortunately, divorce court. <laughs> So, Justice Bolden, what is, what's your take on the importance of state and local courts in our society? Well, you know, for me, because I lived in the state of Michigan my entire life, and I also had the benefit of making laws, right? Mm -hmm. And so being someone that interprets sometimes the law that I voted on, um, I, I think it is, is really important. Um, I think federal um jurisprudence is is you know a little a little, little bit more sexy yeah you know? oh it is yeah <laughs> uh, but the state law and how it's interpreted is really what's going to affect your lives what has affected your parents lives and what will affect future generations to come mm -hmm. and so that the the decisions that the michigan supreme court makes absence you know some intervention um, at the uh, United States Supreme Court level, um, you know, that is binding on the people that live here. And so you should absolutely pay attention to who your judges are, mm -hmm. certainly, uh, because they are going to be making the de decisions about your life, um, how you get sentenced, right? Mm -hmm. um, ju judges have a lot of discretion. But certainly with cases that come to the Michigan Supreme Court, we hear the most important and impactful cases for Michiganders. And I think it's really important for people to pay attention, mm -hmm. not only to how we're voting, but, uh, but the cases that are coming up, how we're voting, but also the temperament of each judge or justice as oh, well is absolutely. incredibly important. Absolutely. I think the... Um you know, my prediction is that, and it might already be happening in, in Michigan, I think in o Ohio it will definitely happen, and that is, you know, once the Dobbs decision sent the question about abortion back to the states, that was always going to go through state and local courts. Mm -hmm. um, once the decision went back to the states, and, and even with Ohio, there was a, an amendment, a constitutional amendment passed Thank recently, mm -hmm. and so I'm telling people, it doesn't matter what side you're on. It doesn't matter whether you agree. The importance of the Ohio Supreme Court is going to really come into play. So you better pay attention. Absolutely. And we've already we've already seen that here. Uh, we, we passed an amendment. Uh, there, there have been uh, lawsuits in the past, um, different decisions uh, that, that have been made. Um, that have been really impactful um, mm -hmm. on Michiganders. And it's how the laws were interpreted. It might be a constitutional amendment, but sometimes those things come to our courts for interpretation mm -hmm. uh, because they can't catch everything in a constitutional amendment. They can't catch it. A former lawmaker here, they don't catch everything. Mm -hmm. um, there's literally no way to contemplate every single situation that will arise when you're crafting a law. And so uh, a lot of that is going to end up in the courts for interpretation. Right. And how it's interpreted matters, and it will be binding on how you live your life. Exactly, especially your court. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> especially in your court. Well, yours too, because you know, ninety what ninety something percent will go to the to the court of appeals, oh, right? That's true. But you we, know, and, and it will, we we take up probably, you know, uh, two or three percent of of court of appeals appeals. Mm -hmm. um, but for us, not, nine, ninety to ninety eight percent will stop at the court of appeals. That's true. Mm -hmm. That's true. I think the Ohio Supreme Court, when they looked at at least my courts district, they took 5% of the mm -hmm. cases that were appealed mm -hmm. from, from my court. Yep. So you're right. Mm -hmm. I need to give myself more credit. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> court of appeals. So I, I wanted to talk to you about um, running for judge, um, you know, the electoral process, mm -hmm. um, because it, it was very different, I'm sure, than when you ran for the state house. You have 
many more rules and you're running statewide versus a, a state house district. How, how was that? Very different, mm -hmm. <laughs> very different, but kind of the, mis the same. It, it's strange. Mm -hmm. uh, you always want to talk to as many people as possible. Mm -hmm. um, obviously going from a district of 90,000 to um, 3 million is, uh, is a challenge, is a feat. Um, but for me, when I was in the district, it was, I'm knocking on 10,000 doors, right? You know, when, when, I, when I was in the state house, it was literal door knocking and asking people for support. Um, that doesn't work as well on a state level as you might, right. <laughs> as yeah, you might I imagine. That's a lot of doors. So it, it's, it's, it's different tactics, but as a judge, um, obviously, well, I should say, let me, let me step back. When you're running for a legislative position, people expect you to have an opinion on everything, mm -hmm. on every single thing. Um, if you don't post a holiday, people are going to be in your inbox, mm -hmm. right? Um, you, you, you have to be at a lot of different events and, and, and things like that. And being a judge, um, obviously you're restricted from, uh, it, you can engage in partisan activities cause you, you still have your first amendment rights, but, um, it's a nonpartisan position mm -hmm. and, and you have to make sure that you're not being, um, you know, too disproportionate in, 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 in where you go and what you do. We also have judicial canons, mm -hmm. um, that prohibit you from engaging in certain levels of speech, um, and, and things like that. Um, because you, are can, you not allowed to ask for money? Not allowed to ask for money. Yeah. We're not allowed to ask for money either, which I won't comment. Uh, but, but as a legislator, that's, that's a, big part of your job. That's a huge it's part. It's a huge part of your job is to, to ask for money. Um, and so that is very, very different. So what you can say, the asking for money, mm -hmm. um, where you can go, very, very different. It can be awkward too. I found, you know, people want you to, they don't necessarily realize you are not a policymaker as a judge. We interpret the law other people make the law. Yes. <laughs> um, and so I, I found that some voters would get frustrated because I could not state a position on a, a, a certain policy. Did you have the same experience? Oh, absolutely. And especially because I was still in the legislature. Oh, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. Um, so now it's a little bit easier, but people know me as a legislator. So I think sometimes people will just ask me just different questions because they're expecting that I know or have a response. And when I, you know, they'll say, what's going on with HB 4002? And I, one, I can't answer you. Right. But two, I have no clue exactly. what the legislature is doing. Okay. And, and you shouldn't. <laughs> I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to get through my cases. Uh, right. And I shouldn't. And, yeah. and that's, that's the difference. So um, it's, it's, I think people are starting to understand the message now, but I realize there has to be a lot more education around the role of judges. Yeah. A lot of people think we are policy makers. And so mm -hmm. I've, I've had people say, can you get my um, family member out of prison? I, no. I can't, no, <laughs> I can't. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they're, they're asking for commutations and I'm like that, that is the governor's office. And, um, so I feel like it's getting a little bit better, but I'm hoping that through service in the way that I'm doing it, I can also educate people on why this branch of government is important, but also our limitations and where mm -hmm. they need to go to find uh, the change that they're looking for. I, you know, I understand that some people's attention was brought to the judicial branch because they were angry about something that the U.S. Supreme Court did. Mm -hmm. But I'm still thankful that at least they're paying attention yes. more now. Yes, I, I'm very thankful. And it gives me an opportunity to educate more people mm -hmm. as to why our courts are so important. I think in Michigan, we dispose of probably 3 million cases per year you know, on, on different levels. Um, but that's a lot of people affected, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, in our society, 
Um, and so our our branch is incredibly important, but we can't can't get anybody out of jail. Uh, no, no, <laughs> you no. know, we, you can't fix parking tickets. We, we can't fix parking. Yes, I don't, I don't know anything yes. about your divorce yes. either. No. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Louder for the people in the back. We can't fix parking tickets. Right. Um, and we also don't make laws. So people have asked me, you know, what are you doing about criminal justice reform, for example? Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, 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 there are some things we can do, obviously, at the Supreme Court level. But as far as, like, uh, you know, I think what they're asking for is more so policy. And so then I have an opportunity to educate them. And so, you know, it's it's interesting in my class, I'm always thinking, what do I want policymakers to know mm -hmm. about the courts? Mm -hmm. um, one of my big things, Justice Bolden, is that you always have to think about, you can have a grand idea, but you always have to think about the administration mm -hmm. of it. Mm -hmm. You have to think about who's gonna pay for it. Mm -hmm. And you know, you might be in an urban county having this great idea, but is this great idea going to fit in a rural county? Um, so talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I, I, I'm sure you have done this too, or, or it might be a possibility, but we actually, there, it's hard to say what you would do on the front end of things, just because I know how the sausage is made and how it's not made. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's just really hard to say every every legislator, just like every judge, has a different philosophy. Mm -hmm. And some people are really just hyper concentrated on their district. And honestly, if it affects the rest of the state of Michigan negatively, they're OK with that. I'm not saying whether that's right or wrong, just saying that's a philosophy. And some are very um, concerned with um, you know, the state of Michigan as a whole. And even if it's not so great for my district, this is good for the overall state. I will say that um, in some of our opinions at the Supreme Court, if there are any policy um, makers listening, we write love letters sometimes. We just say, you know, this is an area where the legislature should probably take a look. <laughs> And you know what, Justice Bolden, you know what I would like policymakers to yeah. know is how hard it is to get language like that in an opinion. Yes. Because other judges will fight you. Yes. Because really what you're doing is just saying, here's how you fix it. Um, but you can't be advisory. Right. So right. Some, sometimes I wish that policymakers would appreciate what it takes to get them those answers. Yes. Yes. Or, or, I mean, it's just, you know, just, just a little note and saying, you know, this is the conclusion that we came to um, because of the way the law is written. Um, but it might be slightly illogical. So. <laughs> yeah, because again, we interpret we're, the we law. We interpret the law and, we we're, and, we're, and, the we're, law. and we're, we're bound by that. So, um, so I would say, you know, it, legislators hopefully have de someone designated to read our opinions and even if mm -hmm. we don't write a love letter if it, if we're interpreting in a way that the legislature did not intend um, then I think it's incumbent upon the legislator later to address it right to fix it you know um, so and sometimes they do and sometimes they don't <laughs> I can say as being a former legislator a lot of times the the judicial branch is just not even on the, the radar, radar. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's just mm -hmm. furthest thing from their minds um, I think in general though our profession is one where people we're in the shadows mm -hmm. until someone needs us yes until yes. someone is in front of us yes. and, and that's why like I always say when you're in front of the judge it's too late to worry about who the judge is and, and that's what I, I tell people we are really the back end of, mm -hmm. of the judicial process um, when you're talking about when the laws are conceived that's really where you want to get in on the, the ground floor because by the time it gets to us and you're relying on our interpretation we're we're at the we're at the back end especially appellate levels like yes. we are yes because we are bound a lot of times by what happened on that first level exactly mm -hmm. so yes by the time it gets to the Supreme Court level you are several levels removed mm -hmm. um, from the conception of of whatever that law was um, that's affecting you. Um, and, and so 
you got to get in on 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 the the front end of things. Right. I totally agree. Well, if you don't mind, we will open it yes. up to some um, a question and answer period. If anyone has any questions for us, well, I shouldn't volunteer for Justice Bolden. Yeah. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Hello, thank you guys both for coming today. This was really, really inspiring and really educational. My name is Maeve. I'm a junior in the Ford School of Public Policy. Um, and I'm currently taking a comparative law class. Um, and we've talked a lot about civil law, about a bunch of different families of law, um, but about civil law and common law um, specifically. And you guys both touched a little bit on like the history of your family um, and how that shaped you both going into law, but also as people. And I guess I'm wondering how does that impact of like your own family's history, your own lived experience, um, kind of inform your, like your position on the court and in the courts, because you talked about representation and how important that is. And I guess I'm just thinking about the role of judges, both in like common law and civil law and how like civil law, they're so much more removed um, and how you think that's really impactful in the system that we have in the US. Um, you know, I think for one, honestly, our existence is essential um, because I know when you go into the courthouse in my county and you look at all the judges' pictures, everyone is going to see someone who looks like them. And in my mind, from the time you see those pictures to the time you're going up to the courtroom, your perception of justice can change after having seen those pictures, knowing that there's somebody in a position of authority that looks like you, um, that might understand the issues that you face uh, and things like that. So number one, I think our very existence, and you know, you, you can't be what you don't see, right? Um, so I think that that's huge. Uh, I also think it is imperative that judges go out and tell people what they see from the bench. Mm. Because you can go to any courthouse anywhere and see what's happening in the community. So for example, when I first took the bench, I first took the bench during the foreclosure crisis. And I was running around, blabbing around town that, I, yes, I saw some people that signed some mortgage papers where I was like, ooh, I'm not sure how you thought that was gonna work. But I also saw those people that were choosing between medical bills and their mortgage, that both were true. Um, right now, our courts are still seeing the impact of COVID. And the impact of COVID on courts is everywhere. Everywhere from, should I have gotten a ticket for an expired license when the BMVs were shut down, all the way to, I can't fulfill the terms of my divorce because my business shut down and I can't pay the child support. To, um, I'm a lawyer who was trying to stall and you should have given me a continuance because it was COVID. And that's my convenient excuse. <laughs> so um, judges who are willing to go out and talk about what they see reflected from the community in the court is, is essential. Because, you know, I know for me, you would never think it would take bravery to say this, but it does. It takes bravery for me to say in our current times that there are both people from whom the public needs protection and people who deserve a second chance. Depending on who I'm talking to, that is radical but you have to have the people who say, I'm on the bench, this is what I'm seeing. Um, please take my word for it because it's lived experience. Yeah, I, 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 even though we are interpreting the law, we bring our lived experiences to the table. Um, and they, that might be in a way that we run our chambers, um, that might be how we interact with individuals, um, like, it's important for me to do these types of events. I probably do two to three events per week, even now, because I think it's important for people to see me um, and to, um, you know, just, just 
know a little bit about me. Um, there are other judges and justices that have different philosophies, you know, that believe that, you know, they should be hidden and not seen and they should make a decision and then go back and do whatever they want to do. I have a different philosophy, right? Um, you know, I think it's very clear that um, I, I'm a believer in, in second chances and things like that. Now, does that mean that, you know, if the law is clear, you know, the, the, the law is going to be the law, but mm -hmm. that might cause me to, um, you know, go to, you know, be present at a reunification day, right? Um, because I believe that if you worked really hard, you should be able to have your children back, right? So it, it, it may not manifest itself in, um, in ways that you think it might, um, but I will also say, uh, you know, there are seven justices on my court. We don't always agree because mm -hmm. we're looking through the lens that, that we have. Um, oh, oh, I'm sorry about these mic. Is it, is it, okay. Um, so some of our decisions will be 4-3 or 5-2. Mm -hmm. um, and that's partially because someone will say, well, you know, when I was a judge, this is how it worked. And sometimes I'm, I'm thinking, well, if we're doing statutory interpretation, I used to be a legislator. And so I know the thought process that goes into making the law right mm -hmm. and so i i can sometimes bring that experience to the table so that's why it's important to have a diverse court with people that have different lived experiences because it really does um make a difference and i just want to say also shout out to pete martell who was one of my first law clerks so <laughs> good to see you <laughs> mm -hmm. Hi, my name's Arama. I'm in the law school. Thank you so much for this talk. It's been really fascinating. Um, one question that I have is I'm, a, I'm in my third year, so I'm, next semester is my last semester. And I feel like one of the things that has most surprised me about law school is the fact that there is so little focus on like state and local issues, despite them constituting so much of where like people actually interact with the legal system. So I, I feel like there's this shortcoming in legal education where we're not even really getting exposed to these issues. Can you talk about for each of you, like how you found your way into this particular, like you've kind of talked about it, but like how you found your way into fo like focusing in state and local issues and then also like what you think law schools can do to better prepare students for practicing or er, for like focusing on these kinds of issues when they like so much of the focus is on federal law, but so much stuff is actually happening at the state and local level. Thanks. Can that be um, an advertisement for Judge Beatty Blunt's state and local courts class in the public policy <laughs> yes, school? Yes, please, please. <laughs> um, you know, as we've discussed, you know, state and local courts are very important. It's, you know, it's easy, especially for a school like Michigan where your students are just gonna go everywhere you know, it is easier um, and probably more efficient to, to focus on the federal. Um, one thing that, you know, if I could be like Nas and rule the world, I would um, change law school a little bit. I would make law school a little bit closer to medical school because you know how medical, I would make it four years though, so, and this isn't totally thought out, so don't hold me to this totally, but you know, you know how medical school, they have like two years of classroom instruction and then they have two years of uh, rotating through different areas of medicine. Um, I would make law school um, closer to that because even I have a lot of law school classmates that kind of fell into mm -hmm. their areas of practice. Um, one of my friends just really couldn't get a summer internship after first year and just accepted a job and ended up loving it. And that's what she's practicing. Um, at the same time, a lot of people who want to be uh, prosecutors or public defenders, uh, law schools don't have a lot to offer them in the way of career services because you know, it tends to be so uh, law firm focused. So I would, change legal training to make it a little bit broader 
um, I also would change some thinking out there that where you went to law school and how much money you make is directly correlated to how smart you are. Mm. Right? Right. <laughs> Um, because now that I've been on the bench and remember I spent 10 years, you know, I was 10 years law and order, you know, I was, no, I wasn't banging a gavel. Nobody bangs a gavel, but you know, I had witnesses next to me and I'm dealing with the jury and, and all of that. And so, you know, I, I have seen, my impression is that sometimes where someone went to law school is really not reflective of how smart they were, but just more a question of opportunity. Um, and that opportunity can go both ways. So sometimes you don't have the opportunity to go to an Ivy League for whatever reason. And sometimes you do have the opportunity to go for whatever reason. So I would not put as much stake in where you went to law school as a judge of whether or not you're a good lawyer. Um, I also have seen from that trial court experience, you know, they have a the reputation as public pretenders instead of public defenders or you know whatever name you want to call them and it's a very frustrating experience to see someone give up a good public defender scrounge up all their money to pay someone who's not as good as the public defender was um, so we have to be very careful um, about law legal education but also the attributes that we put towards people after they get out. And, and I wholeheartedly agree um, from what, from speaking to a lot of my, form, my former law school colleagues, a lot of people just really fell into their career because that's just where the opportunity was. And so mm -hmm. they were looking for the jo a job and the prosecutor's office called them first or the mm -hmm. law firm called them first and and that's and that's kind of uh where where they went um i think law schools can provide a little bit more exposure to different areas um so i i knew one person in law school that had clerked for the michigan supreme court but you know how do you do that mm -hmm. you know um and i will say it's a lot of these jobs are not posted Right. Um, I post just by the way you can you can go on the Michigan Supreme Court right now um, we we post our internships and our clerkships um, but I would say and I'm not an advocate for unpaid labor by any means but shadow people intern with them because it will save you so much time and money down the line to figure out what you don't want to do uh, I thought at one point I might want to do family law. Not for me. It's just not for me. Oh, yeah. Ooh. Just not for me. It's just not for me. <laughs> love, love, hate, money, and children. It's, it's the recipe for the the, dynamite. It's the, everything are, that people are, care the, about. Those are the hardest cases that, mm -hmm. or some of the hardest cases we re receive at the Supreme Court level. So, um, but you don't know what you don't know, right? And so for me, being an, a judicial clerk in the busiest county in the state of Michigan in the civil level, I was able to see what I naturally gravitated to and what cases I loved working on and disposing of and talking to my judge about. And so I was able to be a little bit more strategic because I, I saw a lot of areas of law uh, before I went to a law firm. And so when I did go to my law firm, um, I did a little bit of everything. I, I, I did d defense work, I did insurance defense, I did corporate litigation, I did labor and employment law. And I liked doing all that because I knew what I liked from clerking. And so definitely, I think clerking is amazing. Um, I, I think that might be one of the, the things that um, law schools can incorporate is just pushing uh, or suggesting or making more opportunities available to clerks. So you know what you do and you don't want to do. Uh, again, not an advocate for unpaid labor, but it will save you so much time and money down the road if you know what you do not want to do. I've also noticed um, that, I'll just say people younger than me, <laughs> Um, seem to appreciate more learning 
um, not through like reading books and articles, they seem to learn, uh, to enjoy learning better from the people that are doing it. Yes. So like you'll see in my class is another, uh, tag for me, anyway, um, that you will see a lot of guest speakers because I there is no benefit like learning from the people who are doing it. But I will also go back to one of my points that I made originally, which is that, you know, if that is how you like to learn, again, prepare yourself to be the decision maker. You know, be ready for when it's your turn to change legal education to what you think it should be. So thank you so much for this, uh, this conversation. This is just so rich on many levels. So at the University of Michigan, we have a nonpartisan initiative called UMich Votes that really focuses on um, encouraging uh, civic participation. And one of the things I was struck by is how difficult it is to get information on judicial candidates outside of the Supreme Court. So I remember from my own experience looking up the Supreme Court candidates and there was information available, but the lower courts you go, in the court system you go, it's really hard to get any kind of sense of uh, people's credentials or records or stances on things. Why is that? And I know Ohio has been doing something to change that, mm -hmm. where you were telling me, yeah. Judge Beatty Blunt, that there's there's an initiative underway to that, uh, that allows people to do more research. Mm -hmm. But in Michigan, can you just speak to that? What's the reason for that? What's the remedy for that? Um, because I'm struck by, when we go into the, the ballot room, how little we know about judges outside of some of the highest positions. Mm -hmm. Want me to send you the website of what they do in Ohio? <laughs> yeah. Yes, actually, yes. It is an issue, and it's hard for me to answer that. The, the simple answer is because, because people don't have to, because mm -hmm. people will get elected without having a website, because people will get elected uh, without going to community events. And so there's no motivation for people to do that unless that's demanded of people. Um, through, um, you know, through how they, they show support. Mm -hmm. The other issue is, um, it, it may be the first election, but judges in Michigan have six year terms. So by the time, you know, six years rolls around and you can get an incumbency designation. Now I'm not, not saying anything about incumbency designation, but it does signify who has been there Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people may not think to look up information if they haven't heard anything negative. Mm -hmm. I think the assumption is, uh, well, they're an incumbent. I haven't heard anything. They must be doing a good job. So then there's no motivation to create a website and, and, mm -hmm. and do all these things because, you know, they're doing their job. Yeah. And there's really no system that, you know, that, that is a, a check on that, right? Like, like there is for some of partisan um, people. But I would say, I think League of Women Voters is starting to do more candidate forums um, for judges. And so you can look up um, information on their website about um, participation. And I would say if they do have a website, but not a lot of information, email them called them, mm -hmm. send a message through the website and say, hey, can you can you answer my questions? When's your next community event? Where will you be? I would like to speak with you, knowing that they can't answer certain questions, but just say, hey, I would like to meet you and see how many people are willing uh, willing to do that. Mm -hmm. It's Judge interesting Blank, because- Can you talk about seems, what they do in Ohio? Well, it seems like the lack of information is partly because of the retention election system. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in, in Michigan, once you become a judge, you're, the, ne the question on the ballot is just should we keep you? Versus for me, I get a fresh opponent every six years. Um, so it, it's a little bit different even what you're going to do in between elections mm -hmm. because I don't just get to sit back and say, I'm the incumbent, don't you think you should keep me? You know, as you know, I'm out there saying, hey, I'm Laurel. Will you help me keep my job? It's a, it's a completely different 
calculation. So if I'm running for a retention election, yeah, I probably don't, I might not want to work that hard because I don't have to. Um, so in Ohio, the League of Women Voters um, partnered with the Blitz, Bliss Institute, I think is out of the University of Akron, and they have something called Judicial Votes Count. And you could go, it, it almost functions how a lot of Board of Elections websites function, where you can go and put your address in there and it, all the judicial candidates that you're voting on um, pop up side by side. So you can do a, a comparison between the two. Still though, you still have the judicial canon. So everyone gets on there and says, I'm fair. Everyone gets on there and says, I'm efficient. Like, <laughs> so it, it still can be a little bit difficult, but unfortunately in our very polarized society, there can be buzzwords in there that, that let you know um, where someone falls on certain issues. And, and I will say too, there are a lot of organizations that do endorsements. And oh, so yeah. mm -hmm. if there is an organization that, you know, you, you visit their website quite frequently that makes endorsements, um, I know a lot of organizations are starting to endorse in judicial races a lot more. So that might give you a little bit of a sense, at least where to go or to find out more information about um, a, a particular person, but it is difficult because we are bound by our, our judicial canons and um, that's how you want your judges. You want them to be fair and impartial, mm -hmm. um, right? So, um, but I would encourage, you know, all judges if they're up to have a website in a way for people to contact them. And all I can do is just try to lead by example. And, um, but, but it, is, it is difficult. I would also say again, because like I said, so many times people don't care about judges until they're in front of one. Um, but here's the thing, you know, it takes a lot of effort to find that information. I get it. But when you think about, I'm picking a person that if I got divorced would make the decision about how my property would be divided. If you think about, I'm making a decision about who would decide if I'm a victim of a crime, how much restitution I would get. The person who's making the decision about my neighbor dispute, the person who's making the decision because I feel my doctor did something wrong, the people who are making the decision about whether it's constitutional to carry a gun in a certain place or in a certain way. So when you think about it on a decision level, I think it's worth the work to figure out who, who's gonna be up there. Oh, and I will say that um, getting your absentee ballot is actually, it's not actually, it's very helpful because then you have all the candidates ahead of time and you can, you know, do your own research with the ballot. Um, and so, I mean, but that's for any candidate, not necessarily judicial, but if you do have any questions in, it's harder when you get to the ballot box and you're like, wait, who is this person? I've right. never heard of them and they have a incumbency designation. You're like, well, I haven't heard anything about them. I'll just vote for them. It is a lot easier if you have your absentee ballot and that you can, um, you know, Google everybody before mm -hmm. you vote. Because I bet that you have probably heard some kind of scary reasons people voted for you. I remember someone telling me, your yard sign was in my neighbor's yard and they always keep their grass cut. So I voted for you. Um, or my, my second grade teacher's name was Laurel and I really liked her, so I voted for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, mm -hmm. um, I, I, I can't think of, I would, I would say for us, because in Ohio, I'm, I'm not sure if you have straight ticket voting in Ohio, but we have it in Michigan. And so for me, obviously we're in the nonpartisan category, but you can vote straight ticket, so you're voting for all of the people in, in a particular political party. Yeah. It's like press you, all, you just You all? just circle one. You just circle one and it, it just votes for everybody in the, the partisan section under that party. Right? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But a lot of people didn't realize, and especially because I had come from a political world, 
that you have to vote separately in the nonpartisan section and you actually have to bubble in the names in the partisan, nonpartisan section. Mm -hmm. And so people would come to me and say, I voted straight ticket. Oh. I got you. And you're like, and no, you no. don't. <laughs> you, look, actually, you left me hanging. You left me hanging. <laughs> you left me hanging. <laughs> so that was, that was kind of the, one of the, the biggest, biggest things. And I'm just like, wow, we, we need more education. Um, See, and it's a little bit different in Ohio now. We used to have straight nonpartisan judicial elections, but now Ohio Supreme Court and the Court of Appeals only have party affiliation on the ballot. Oh. Trial courts do not. Interesting. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's interesting too, because the way that the districts are set up, you know, Cleveland, Columbus, Cincinnati, those districts are just that, those one counties. And so, um, you had a, a lot of judges that had no idea what was going to happen with their election because of how their district fell between Republicans and Democrats. So they didn't know what was going to happen, especially the first time we had the party affiliation on the ballots. Wow. <laughs> so we have party affiliation and we also, you can't serve as a judge after 70. Yes. So we, we do have um, the age restriction after 70. And at the Supreme Court, here it's weird. We don't have party affiliations, but you have to be nominated by a political party unless you're an incumbent. I know. I know. I so know. This, so this is why if I'm an incumbent, I'm like. So that's why there's more information. Day? Yeah, that's why there's more information about the Supreme Court, because you're nominated by um, a political party. So, you know, it, it's. It, there's a different system in there then but that doesn't apply for our, our court of appeals or lower lower courts but uh but but you still you're but you're nonpartisan and you're there's no party affiliation on your ballot oh okay that yeah it's much more complicated <laughs> who knew that did anybody know that Ohio. okay well, yes in the back <laughs> so that's how it works yes what other question hi um i'm shane i'm a freshman um, and I'm a reporter with the Michigan Daily. Um, so we've heard Supreme Court Justice John Roberts say that judges are like umpires. Um, they just call balls and strikes. Um, so what are your thoughts on his view and how it relates to important sweeping cases that are coming up into the state courts, specifically re um, relating to reproductive rights and election laws? I think he was right. I mean, that's, that's how our government is set up. You know, and, and that's part of um, the transition into getting on the bench is because you've gone from, you know, player to referee. You've gone from advocate to judge. At the end of the day, we do not make laws. We interpret them. And so we have to stay in our lane, uh, essentially. Um, I think that, you know, there on Justice Bolden's level, it's a little bit different um, because where I served, you know, that trial court, you know, you're the, the judge who's taking in the facts and dealing with the jury and things like that. So on that first level, though, a lot of the facts are set. So then you move to the second era, um, area, Court of Appeals, where I am now. That court is a court of error. What we're doing is just to make sure that our colleagues on the first level didn't mess something up. Now, where things can get changed is on the Supreme Court. Um, and so, you know, even then though, you're still, still yeah. you, you not make, you might be interpreting what a word means, but you're not the one putting the word in there. Right. And, and that makes all the difference. And I, and I will say to, yes, we are umpires, but um, I shouldn't say, but, and I know that everyone has watched a game and a referee has made a call and everybody in the stands are like, what? I can't believe that. That's not how I saw things. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, we are umpires and uh, we call balls and strikes that doesn't mean that someone else won't see it differently. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's why true. you have decisions um, that are not uniform on 
um, on my level or on the United States Supreme Court level. Um, so we call it like we see it. And um, that might be different from each other. And it's why we sit in groups on yes. the appellate level. Yes. You know, I think another thing that's so important to remember is that, you know, judges don't fix things. Judges resolve disputes. And there's a difference. Because in the, the murder criminal case, you can't fix it because you can't bring somebody back. You know, in a medical malpractice case, if somebody, or a car accident case or something, somebody gets really seriously injured, you can't fix it. All you can do is resolve the dispute. Um, and you have to keep that difference in mind because it, it helps you stay in your judicial branch of government lane. Hello, thank you guys so much for this presentation. It's been amazing. Um, my name's Audrey Thetford. I'm a senior at the Ross School of Business and I'm also a member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, Beta Eta Chapter, so hello, Soror. Um, but I, first of all, I just wanna say it's been so inspiring to see both of you. I know you said um, you can't be what you can't see and like I never thought I would see this in my lifetime, so it honestly makes me really emotional and I just wanna thank you guys again for just being here and doing what you do. Um, but I wanted to talk about how you guys talked about your personal philosophies and how sometimes people interpret what you do as radical. And I know here at the University of Michigan, we are around a lot of smart college students with very different perspectives that it can kind of make you really rethink your own and what is right. And on top of imposter syndrome, it can just be kind of hard to have confidence in your own philosophy. So I'm curious how you guys have gotten confidence in defending and pushing your own philosophies in your positions and if you have any advice for us on how to do that in our personal life and like when we become leaders further on. Um, you know, first of all, I will point out to you that you are seeing 49-year-old Laurel. You're not seeing 19-year-old Laurel. You know what I'm saying? So you can't, don't compare yourself to us. First of all, you see what I mean? Because all of the experiences that we've talked about tonight is what made us who we are, you know? Um, and getting through certain experiences. You know, when I was appointed judge, three days of negative press, right? But I got through it. And, you know, having that experience of, I don't, didn't know if somebody was coming at me with racism, ageism, sexism, I mean, Could you know, any of, them. <laughs> any of them, you know, or any combination. And like, that's when I discovered you put your head down and do the work. And that's because otherwise you're just gonna spend a whole lot of time trying to convince people that you could do this job, right? But I had that experience and now I'm here telling you. And you might have that experience and you might say, yeah, that lady named Laurel said that she went through this too, but she sat there and told me about it, so it's possible to get through it. I have also, again, being 49-year-old Laurel, um, I see how different experiences, things are getting, that things are changing. Um, I was the first person to, um, in my court, to have a baby while serving. And I, it was difficult, but I saw already the, the next woman who got pregnant while she was serving had a, diff, uh, had a less difficult time than I did. So I've lived 49 years and so I've, I have the opportunity to look back and see you know, how some of those sticky situations um, worked out for the best, right? Um, I would say one of the greatest ways that I have learned about myself and um, overcome imposter syndrome is watching who I am around. Um, sometimes even watching the TV I watch and the music I listen to. Um, but I can say, like, honestly, Dean Watkins Hayes 
um, I knew her at Spelman. And so having a group of friends through all these years, um, through uh, her getting her PhD, me getting, uh, being in law school, another friend going to medical school, our fourth friend went to business school. Um, we all pushed each other. We all, you know, all in the midnight hour, we're there to say, you're not as bad as you think you are. <laughs> You know, so for me, that has um, really been helpful, as well as um, not accepting shade from trees that don't bear fruit. I'm taking that one. I'm taking that one. Uh, I think I read that on Facebook one time. <laughs> but it, I'll but attribute it's so, that to you. But huh? it's, it's so true. It's so true. Because if you think about it, no matter if it's external or internal, a lot of times the, the voice that's telling you no, you can't or whatever is a tree that doesn't bear fruit. You know what I mean? I, the, the best part of me is very positive. The best part of me encourages myself. The best part of me also knows what I'm not good at. Uh, and so I think that that um, has all has helped me, and and I would also again emphasize to you, you know, just look at us and just be like, girl goals or whatever that ha the hashtag is lately, you know, because again, you know, we probably had the same fears and doubts or whatever when we were your age too. Um, I would I would give a couple nuggets. A lot of people ask me, do I have imposter syndrome? And no, I don't. Um, yeah. just, I don't. Uh, not at this point. I can't say that I never did. I did at one point, but at this point, I do not um, because I know how hard I worked. I know what it took to get here. Um, and so one thing I have always told myself, even when I doubted myself, was you might have a different skill set than me, but no one's going to work harder than me. Mm -hmm. Nobody. And I wholeheartedly be believe that in myself. And that doesn't mean I win every single time. But once I'm done, I will say no one worked harder than me. And that's just my self-motivation. But Justice Bolden, think about it. You lost so well that you got <laughs> no, the appointment. I got appointed. You know? Yeah. Right. Right. And, and we... I think we can all agree if I did not do well, I would not have exactly. gotten appointed, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I will also say okay. critics rarely make the history books too. When someone tells you you can't do something, they're looking from their lens of inability, not yours. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. only you know what you're capable of doing because you have something inside of you telling you that you should be doing X, Y, and Z. And you've gotten to the place that you've gotten to because of you, your work ethic, your family support system, all of these things. And so someone that would not dare do what you have done or trying to do, telling you what you can't do, cannot infiltrate you to the point where you doubt yourself. Mm -hmm. You just, it just, it just can't. Um, and that's kind of the point that I got to when I'm when I'm running for Michigan Supreme Court and someone's telling me I'm unqualified. I'm doing something that you wouldn't dare to do mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. many people who may be qualified are not daring to do. So I can't accept that criticism um, because I'm the one that's out here trying. Mm -hmm. um, the, the third the third thing is. Um, you, oh, I forgot. Oh, what's my third thing? It was good too. I, I got one though while you oh, think okay, of it. Yes. <laughs> I, I'll tell you, and I'll give credit to my friend, Elizabeth Blount McCormick, who, when, when she was asked about imposter syndrome, you know what she says to herself? You know, because imposter syndrome, you're saying, why me? Right? She says, why not me? Why not? Why not mm -hmm. me? And when you, when you turn your mindset like that, you know, even asking the question, it emboldens you, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. I don't remember what I was going to say, but that was a good point. And point. it was going to be good, too. It was yeah, going to be good. Like, oh, and Elizabeth is your soror, too. Mm -hmm. We love the pink and green. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, but yeah, no, I, I, oh, 
And you also have to determine whether the critique is coming from a place of love or coming from a place of trying to stunt your growth. Mm -hmm. That is really hard to discern, um, but it will always be revealed. And so when certain people tell me certain things and it's a critique and, and you know, saying, Kyra, you really need to, need to step it up here. You need to do better. I know they're saying it out of love. After I won my second election and my primary, I won with 90% of the vote. You know, my mom said, we need to find those 10%. Oh. <laughs> we, we have to find those 10%. I said, mom, I don't think we can do that. Yeah, <laughs> mom, you know? mom, let's go to SmackDown. But, right. <laughs> and, but I knew it was coming from a place of love that it wasn't that you weren't that she wasn't saying I wasn't good enough, obviously, but you could have done better, but in a place of love. Um, and then there are people that just told me I shouldn't run for state representative because I was too young. Start at school board. You're not qualified oh, yeah. to run mm -hmm. for state representative. You've never served in public office. Um, you know, you don't have the credentials. You don't, whatever, whatever. And, and see, that is a baby boomer way. <laughs> Yeah. That you know what I mean? To yeah. wait in line. Wait, wait your turn. Wait your turn. Oh my goodness, if mm -hmm. I had a dollar. Mm -hmm. Wait your turn. But I had to realize that those people that said that to me didn't know me. So you couldn't tell me if I was qualified or not. You don't know me. Um, you don't know what I'm capable of. And um I don't have to wait my turn. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so unfortunately we got the signal. Don't wait your turn. I'm going to leave it at that because I, I want to end it on that because I really appreciate that line. And I so, so, so um, appreciate you coming here and had such a lovely time talking yes. with you. Thank you Thanks so much. Thanks, everyone, for coming.